Hello and welcome to the Everything Is Black and White podcast. It's time for the match preview with me, Andrew Musgrove, and John Gibson. But before we look ahead to the final game of the 2023-24 season against Brentford, we're going to look back on a hugely frustrating defeat to Manchester United at Old Trafford. Newcastle United lost 3-2. Man United took the lead through Kobe Mainu just after the half-hour mark. Anthony Gordon made it 1-1 shortly after half-time before Ahmed Diallo got a second for the Red Devils, followed by Ramos Holland adding a third. The Magpies had chances at 1-1 to get uh, to take the game away from the host, but Alexander Isak and Sean Longstaff could not put the ball in the back of the net. We're going to get into what happened and why the team selection and what it means for Newcastle United's European hopes. This is the Everything is Black and White podcast. Please hit like, subscribe, follow. Let's get on with the show. John, how are we feeling about last night? Frustrated, angry, irritated, annoyed. Every word you can think of apart from a joyous word. And it was a yet another wasted opportunity. Uh, it's been a disaster. We've taken one point out of the last six. I feared for us after we dropped two points uh, against Brighton. And that has come home to roost um, because the Manchester United situation, I mean, they were awful. They've set uh, records all season for negative records. Uh, and yet we go down there and um, allow them to have a great finale at home it is so annoying so irritating um the thing is now not in our our hands we're batting for the europa conference league in reality but the things are possible but in reality which is the third tier league which is not the best by any means but let's be brutally truthful about it Eddie Howe has said all season that the target for Newcastle United, regardless of any side effects through injuries, etc., is getting into Europe. Therefore, if we have a bad day in London against Brentford and don't get into Europe, we fail to make um, our goal for the season. And yes, there'll be reasons for that. And one of them that'll be flagged up very much by the club itself will be injuries. And I accept that. But they've also got to accept it's because of the most horrendous away record it's possible to, to think of for a team that's going it for Europe at the top end of the table because we've lost 11 out of 18 on the road in the Premier League this season. That is terrible. And that is our own fault. The injuries is not. But that is our own fault. And we must, even if we escape on the last day and make you, we've got to draw a, a huge breath, say thanks, and still admit that our away form has put us under severe pressure. And guess what? On the, on the last day of the season, we're playing away. Yeah, we'll get into the reasons for this poor away record this season later on in the show, because I did ask, viewers and listeners on social media to get in touch with the reasons they think are behind this poor away form and i'll let you know what they said in a little while i mean after sleeping on it john i had hoped when i went to bed last night that i'd wake up and feel a bit better about the performance and the results at old trafford but after i've just woken up even more frustrated at what happened as you've mentioned there my united are awful this is the worst my united side i have seen in in my lifetime and the team that played last night is arguably a reserve team of the worst team I've seen in my lifetime. I mean, you've got Johnny Evans at centre-back, for example. Uh, Dollar over at left-back. The players out of position, Casemiro. And teams have punished my United this season. They've done so at Old Trafford. If they'd lost to Newcastle United last night, it would have meant this season becomes their worst home run since the early 70s. And yet Newcastle United could not take advantage of all the negative elements surrounding the hosts. Very frustrating. Oh, I, I mean, hugely so, because this was a real opportunity. Um, and because, as you say, and my memory goes back a lot longer than yours, and unfortunately, because I'm that much older, and, and it is. I mean, I go way, way back in the Manchester United sides that I saw Newcastle beat. Uh, if you go back to the 70s after Hereford, when they beat uh, Manchester United in Supermax days, Manchester United had low best in um, Charlton. Uh, they were a decent side. Kabai were a decent side. 
this is a shocking side. If this team wasn't called Manchester United, you would be talking about them as being a nothing side. You know, if they were called Burnley or Sheffield United, uh, you wouldn't be surprised the way they play. And even against us, um, they they looked very, very shaky and, and, and one paced. And for goodness sake, Casemiro got a plus at the end of the game for playing centre-half the way he played centre-half. I mean, what does that say about Newcastle United? Because him and Johnny Evans have been an embarrassment to them in the position that Casemiro was playing. He's a midfielder. Johnny Evans is more towards 40 than he is towards 30. Uh, so they are shocking. And there were signs there last night that Newcastle could get at them and do things um, early on. And then what do we get? Can you believe the defending on the three goals that Manchester United got? I mean, what is it with Newcastle? Had these three guys got B.O. or something? I mean, were you allowed not to get anywhere close to them? I mean, the, the young boy that scored the first goal was embarrassed. He actually looked round before he put the ball in the net to say, where's everybody and am I on side? You actually can see him because I watched it again. Look round and then he passed the ball into the net. But he looked like he couldn't believe he was standing by himself and he couldn't believe he was on side. And our marking on the three goals was absolutely atrocious. In Trippier, a seasoned pro on the first goal, which turned the game, obviously, because we had started reasonably well, he is standing looking across the line. The, the scorer isn't behind him and he's playing him on because he hasn't come out quick enough. Now, one match ago, Casemiro was murdered um, nationally for not coming out quickly enough in Manchester United conceded the goal against Arsenal. Trippier did as badly on, a, on their first goal as Casemiro did against Arsenal. It was criminal. And yes, he was rusty. And boy, did he look it. But this has got nothing to do with rust. This is alertness. This is coming out. This was an experienced player looking along the line the fellow wasn't behind him and, and he plays him on. And our defending was absolutely abysmal. It, it was. And the defending is the most frustrating part about the whole performance because some would argue, John, that Newcastle United had the chances to win the game. And I agree. You know, they had Alexander Isak, Sean Longstaff, Dan Byrne, Joe Linton, all had really good chances. But I guess it sort of becomes irrelevant, doesn't it, when you are defending in the manner that they do. And I think the other frustrating thing about it is the criticisms of the three goals they conceded are criticisms that we've spoken about time and time and time again. People might say they're individual mistakes, but they're being repeated time and time again. And I look particularly at that first goal, and what really frustrates us even more, John, is that in that first half in particular... The midfield was getting bypassed and the defence was very disjointed. But the midfield three of Bruno, Longstaff and Elliot Anderson, when it was a midfield three, they just seemed to forget about tracking the men. They would track them in the first passage of play. And then when Man United either passed the back, sideways, whatever, they then just let the man they followed run. And it was Bruno Fernandes, it was Manu. And if you watch the first goal, Bruno Gimresh allows Manu just to run off him. He turns his back on him. Now, Trippier's got a lot of stick, and quite rightly, for not stepping out. But I think the first sentence is, how has Menu been allowed to break free? I'm not even going to use the word break free. He's just literally walked into the box. And it's those mistakes, not following your man, the midfield, the space between the midfield and the defence. I'm at a loss because we, 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 we are just repeating ourselves time and time again. And for me, I thought the midfield was particularly poor last night. I mean, you look, yes, there were chances for us and yes, we didn't take them. But you look at the three components. The back was obviously very, very bad and I include the keeper in the back four because the mark-up, et cetera, et cetera, was horrendous. As you rightly pointed out, the midfield wasn't at the races, either in terms of creativity or in terms of the defensive job, and the forwards missed chances. So the three components were all individually poor. But haven't we been talking about this all season? I'm getting almost bored with saying it. There's only one game to go. Are we going to put it right miraculously? 
between now and running out at four o'clock on, on Sunday? We haven't so far. And Eddie keeps saying in his quotes, his after match quotes, and this is not like us, he's talking about. I'm sorry, this season, this is like us. That is the whole problem. You see, this is not like us. If he was saying this is not like us from last season, correct. But this is not like us. Yes, it is, Eddie. This is exactly like us. This is what we now do. And it was absolutely shocking. And it was against such an average side. And we ended up, we got what we deserved. Now, can we put that right in time to go to Brentford and try to rescue something? It's all mental. It's all in the head. We're, either, we're not going to put it right on the training ground because we, we've had time to do that match after match after match, and we haven't. And, um, you know, it, it's mental. It's how much you want it. It's how disciplined you can be, etc., cetera, et cetera. But we were poor, and they must have been very, very grateful um, to be playing us as opposed to somebody else because it allowed them to get out of, uh, the dungeon in the last home game and con the crowd that oh we, you know we found something else before we go to the cup final. No, you didn't. We give you. Well, that's it. You saw the way Ten Hag grabbed the mic at the end of the the game and he spoke to the crowd and it wasn't fully uh, well received, was it? But they were celebrating that like like a cup victory, and that's the other frustrating thing is that they were overjoyed Manchester United to pick up that victory. And you, they were there for the taking, and Newcastle and I have had a, 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 it's a real missed opportunity for them. And I, I just look at that midfield three, John, and obviously people will say, well, you're missing Joe Linton, you're missing Tenari, but I don't know if those two are the answers. Now, Joe Linton missing has been a huge, huge, you know, dagger to the heart uh, for Newcastle United. He's been massively missed, but I still think Newcastle need to go out and get just an old fashioned number six. If such a thing well, exists, you know, someone that just sits there, protects the uh, the back four, pulls the strings, little ankle bites there, you know, go and find a check to your order, you know, someone that just gets the challenge in. Okay, he might look a little bit nervous going over the halfway line, but that doesn't matter because what he does in between the space, between the, 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 the midfield two and the back four is worth its weight in gold. Well, I mean, rewind our podcast for the season and you can go back four months and you find a, a podcast that says we need a number six. I mean, you know, it, and it hasn't been, it wasn't addressed in the January window. Uh, there was talk that we didn't. It was actually, Eddie suggested we didn't need a six. And, um, well, it, we've all got our opinions and uh, only his count, but we've got a right to ours as well. And uh, I would just suggest we do need a six. I would suggest we do need a, a centre forward because we've got thin cover there. I would suggest we do need an outside right. I would suggest we do need a centre half. And if we don't get all those positions sorted in the summer, we'll be talking like this again next season. Um, you know, it, has progress been made? Well, if we get back into Europe, it was said, we'll have, we'll have made a little bit of progress. It'll be as good as we did last season, etc., etc. I don't know that that's now going to be the case because um, the case is that we have had an umbrella protecting us from criticism, which is uh, massive injuries which Manchester United have had, which Spurs have had, which other clubs have had, um, which Brighton's had. But um, that's been number well. But there's also some home truths, like our away form and our discipline during 90 minutes, or lack of it. And, and all that's come home to us. And it's no surprise. We're sitting here one game from the end of the season saying what we were saying at the end of last year. Yeah, and I, what I will point out though is that I was genuine in my prediction the last time we spoke. I was fully confident Newcastle would beat Manchester United at, at Old Trafford and they should do with the teams that were put out. They have the better team based on last night's start at 11. But quite clearly, Newcastle United's mentality issues on the road, they're just a massive problem. And we said a few weeks ago, John, or without our I said, I, I've come to the point now where we just accept it for this season, and Eddie Howe then has to work his socks off in the summer to find the remedy. 
whether that's working with the players he's got, bringing in another player. I mean, I would try and sign uh, Jao Polina from Fulham because he is exactly the type of player they need in that midfield. You know, his tackles, 298 tackles this season, tackle success rate, 53%. He is an absolute warrior in the midfield in the midfield. Now he's going to probably go to Bayern Munich. He's going to cost you the best part of 50, 60 million pounds and more. But he is ex exactly the type of player Newcastle United need in the summer to show up that midfield. Yeah. You know, you say, and I understand where you're coming from, but you say, you know, we should have won last night because on paper we've got the better team, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. No, we haven't. We're as bad as them. Away when we are away from home, which we were last night. We're not the, we've got the better team on paper, but on paper they would say we've got Bruno Fernandez, we've got Mayo who's going to play for England, who's 18, we've got Rashford who's absolutely having a horrendous season, incidentally, but he's got this huge background. Their mentality is wrong, their egos get in the way. It's not egos with us, but it's a mentality with us. But, you know, are we kidding ourselves? that some individuals, and I'm, we're not mentioning them by name, but some individuals are playing on reputation and are not playing on form because we aren't as good, or we perhaps not as good as we think we are. We being Newcastle United, not me and you. Um, you know, all those questions have got to be asked in the summer because what this season has told us is every time we play away, want a potential hiding, regardless of what the opposition is, regardless of whether we're going to Everton, who were nearly bumped with the league and getting chomped 3-0, uh, or going to Luton and losing, or going to Manchester United, or one of the top three sides where we would expect to lose. We are on a sticky wicket. We weren't last season. We weren't last season. Our waveform last season was terrific. We've managed to get by on our home form where there's been one or two blips that have shocked us. And by the way, we were set up. Let's not forget the Brighton result. I mean, Manchester United was held. But those two points, I said at the time in the press box at St. James's Park, these two points will come home to bite us. And they did because of what happened last night. That was a bad result as well. Um, at home to Brighton because they had nothing to play for. Uh, they were coming off a bad run of form, apart from winning their last game. They'd had six without a win. They, they went back to losing again last night. We've got to hope that they'll do something against Man U on Sunday. Um, but that was a bad result, and this is a bad result. And we're, 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 going, we're finishing with a win pay. It's one point out of six with three points available on Sunday. Is it going to be one point out of nine? Or is it going to be four out of nine? You ask me now, I, I, I do fear what will happen on Sunday, but we'll get into that in a moment. I, I want to get into the responses from those on social media when I asked this morning, what is the reason for Newcastle's poor away form? So they're 15th on the table when it comes to away games, played 18, won five, drawn two, lost 11, scored 32, conceded 38. Now only... Um, three teams have conceded more than Newcastle on the road. Luton, Sheffield United, and I think it's Chelsea. And then 11 games lost, and you look at only um, Luton and Sheffield United have lost more Brentford as well um, on 12. So well, I'm just repeating what you've said. The away form is absolutely dreadful. So I did ask people, and the responses have been... Uh, Interesting. Quite a few responses, uh, 69 in total. So I'm not going to read all of them. I'm just going to read through uh, two or three, John, and get your your thoughts. So the Irish jury uh, got in touch to say, I think it's genuinely uh, down to the type of players we seem to have. They all thrive off the passion of the crowd, which you can see by our home form, which Newcastle lie fourth in the, the form table. I think without that, some of them are unable to motivate themselves to play to their best ability. I can get where he's coming from, but I also think professional footballers, yes, the home crowd's going to have a massive impact, but you should be going to places, and I will include Old Trafford in this, where things are disjointed, where things are not, you know, going well, you should be able to go there and put in a better performance and and, and win. 
in in, in a weird grounds um, like Old Trafford, but also like kind of where throw at Luton, for example. But I mean, we we were doing that last season. Last season, I think we only lost about three away from home. Um, we were going away. We had the wonderful home crowd, but we were going away and getting results. Top teams do that. And I think the top three, off the top of my head, the last time I looked, which was two or three games back, the top three sides in the league were also in the top three uh, for away form. You, you know, it, big sides can play home and away. Uh, there's no question about that. Um, and Newcastle proved they could do last season. Uh, they've done anything but this season. Yes, they haven't got a huge crowd behind them, and I know where our friends are coming from, but... Uh, their way support when it's away from home, they sell out away from home every game and they off make themselves heard. And I could hear them last night, despite the number of people that were in the crowd uh, at Old Trafford. I could hear our way support. The way support is terrific for them. Um, they, just, they just seem to approach it so wrongly and mentally they're unstable in, in, in their discipline. And therefore, they, they start ball chasing and people run through the middle of the field and, and get onto a back four, which is which is shaky and, and, and is easily taken. And yes, we've off missed the goalkeeper. Dubovka is nowhere near what Pope is in his pump. Dubovka is not a top Premier League goalkeeper, no question about that. Um, but well, it might surprise you, John, that... Martin Dubrovka came up quite a few times in the 69 replies that I've had. So yeah. I'm not going to read out all of them because there's quite a few. But I was going to ask you later on the show, but we'll do it now. Should Nick Pope have started against Manchester United? I said on our last episode that I would have started him. I put forth the case that if he's fit enough to be on the bench, he should be starting. He'd be on the bench three games now. Now, Eddie Howe was asked about his team selection um, after the game and he, he spoke about wanting players to be, you know, a hundred percent fit. But I would put forward the point that we are now at the business end of the season. We now have two games left or we have one game left. We had obviously two before we kicked off against Manchester United where you, you know, you need to win, John, you need maximum points. And if they're fit enough to be on the bench, then they're fit enough to be in the start 11 to help you get over the line. Uh, Eddie Howe said, we have players back in the available, but are they 100% themselves? No, that's a difficult position that I'm in. I need them to enter the pitch feeling themselves and feeling good. I picked the team that I went with. I believed in the team. I thought the team performed well, but just not well enough in those key moments. You know, maybe you can apply what he's saying there to maybe Joe Linton. Um, but I think when it comes to Nick Pope, he had to start against Manchester United, didn't he? And we've seen really especially with that third goal, John, Martin Dubrovka, just, he's just not up to scratch. Um, I feel like a broken record because I am keep repeating what I've been saying for, for an awful long time. I mean, I can follow what Eddie's talking about, about outfield players, if, because if you're fit enough to be on the bench, it doesn't mean you're fit enough to play an hour and a half if you're an outfield player. Because of physic the physicality, the running about, you might get a good 20 minutes out of somebody, but you won't get an hour and a half. Goalkeeper is a totally different kettle of fish. If you're good enough to be on the bench as a goalkeeper, you're good enough to, to start, or you ought to be. Um, and Dubravka hasn't looked at all um, like a top Premier League goalkeeper. Uh, sad, but true. Um, and yes, uh, Pope ought to have started, in my opinion, uh, we're almost at the stage where it's too late. It isn't, and you can never give up because you never know what's going to happen if we win uh, it, it Brentford, so you can't give up. But we've left it a bit late to suddenly decide that we, you know, we perhaps should have started Pope. I'm talking about the manager, not about us, because uh, we don't pick a side. Or we should have started Joe Linton, or we needed this, or we needed that, because We've got one game to go. Um, but you've got to think that there's something in Eddie's mind about Pope and his shoulder that he's not comfortable with because it would be a no-brainer under normal circumstances for Pope to have been in three games ago when he when he when he first made the bench. If he was capable of making the bench, you would have thought he would have started. 
Hmm. Well, it's interesting because we've seen earlier in the season players come back maybe before they are ready and criticism being thrown at the feet of Newcastle United. And I'm just wondering maybe whether they've looked at that and thought, okay, maybe we maybe we did get it wrong with Sven Botman, for example, and this time we'll not rush anyone back before we know they're 100% ready. I guess others would say, John, well, that that's okay to do that in the middle of the season when you've got 10, 12 games to come because that player returning when he's fully ready to have, will have seven, eight games to make an influence. Right now, before the Man United game, you had two games left. And for me, unless you're going to risk serious damage to Joe Linton, and of course, look, we caveat this by saying Eddie Howe and his men, medical staff have the players' best interests at heart. They, they work with them day in, day out. So they see things we don't. We trust the manager's judgment. This is just our opinion, my opinion. Two games to go, you put Joe Linton into that park, even if it's just for an hour. You put him in, you let him leave his mark for the first hour, then you bring him off. Well, you, you were convinced he was a show in at Man U, weren't I you? Was. That he was being kept to play at Man yeah. U, and he wasn't. Because otherwise, what's he been kept for? Is, it, is, he, is he protecting them so he gets through pre-season and he's raring to go? I guess what, what he's game. thinking, and I'm, it's not my thought, because I've said that I would have Joe Linton in the side as well. But what he's thinking, presumably, he's a very, very big man who's um, therefore slow to come back from a long layoff because to get up to, to speed, and I don't mean quickness, I mean sharpness, um, uh, and he takes a bit longer before he hits the ground running than a small, slim guy like, say, uh, Almiron or, or Gordon or Trippier would do. That, you've got to presume, is the sort of thinking Eddie's thinking about because there's no question how much he means to Newcastle United and there's no question that they realise that because of the way they went about trying to get him to sign a new contract, which he was successful with. But, you know, th there's nothing to protect anybody for. We are going to go to, Brent to Brentford. Why You can't protect Pope and you can't protect uh, Joe Linton because at the end of that game, they've got all summer before they play again. So, and by the way, I, Callum Wilson, whether he's feeling a tight chest, or he's got a sniffle or it's got some... What are you keeping him for? It, it, it's the end of the season. Push him out there and say, listen, Pally, you're 90 grand a year. We want you 90 grand a week. Never mind you, I'd settle for 90 grand a year, but he's on 90 grand a week. Um, so, you know, get out there, we need you, etc., etc. There's nothing to hold people back for uh, now, unless you think they're going to have a horrendous injury, it's going to keep them out all summer. But if that was the case, these guys shouldn't have been on the bench. So I don't think that is the case. So what are we, what are we waiting for? It's now or never. And it was could easily be said to be now and ever before Man U. But that's gone and we can't do anything about that and we can't replay that game. We can't put our hand up and say, can we have that game again, guys? Because we've got something wrong and we would like that. We've got one game to go and we've got to be brave and we've got to go out there with, with all guns firing to try to do it. Because it is death or glory. Um, and it might well be too late now. But that doesn't mean you, you give up and you, you put the white flag up and we all go home and get ready to go on the beach. Uh, it, it isn't like that anymore. But, um, you know, you, you look and you, you wonder, and I do take the theory that you brought up, which is interesting, that we brought players back so quick, so we'll not quite do it. That can apply to uh, outfield players and probably is one of the reasons we haven't seen Joe Linton starters yet, but it certainly doesn't apply to a goalkeeper. Uh, and why haven't we seen Pope? If his mm. shoulder's a bit dodgy, why is he the sub keeper? Because you, you look at what keeps happening at Man City, their cover goalkeeper's gone on as a sub four times or something this season. So you, you can't have to do that. So if he's good enough to be on the bench, and okay, Carrius is no doubt finished at the club now because he's. He's away, etc. So is he just sitting there because of that situation? Or is he sitting there really because he, he is ready to play? And if he is ready to play, what's he doing sitting on the bench? 
you may as yeah. well be sitting next to me. You, you know, you want them on the field. Yeah, certainly, Joe. I think we probably will see Nick Pope against Brentford. I think we'll see Joe Linton as well uh, against Brentford. And we'll get onto the potential team in a moment. But I think Joe Linton would have had um, quite a lot of success in that midfield against Manchester United. But as I say, we can't turn back the clock. Just sticking with John, the subject of players coming back. We saw Kieran Trippier start uh, against Manchester United. And I had a feeling he would do. I said he would do. Uh, it was admittedly a little bit enforced because of the injury to hadn't. Tino Livermento. I wish um, he hadn't. We didn't know about yeah. Livermento, so we don't know if he would have started if Livermento had been fit. Uh, well, he, well he, he wasn't fit and he isn't fit for Brentford, yeah. Liv, Livermento. We don't know if he'd been fit, whether he would have started Trippier or not. We know what we, th we think should happen, but that doesn't mean he would have automatically done it. I thought Trippier looked very rusty looked very average in all his play, not just the offside situation, in general open play. I didn't think he looked the guy of last season when he was a total inspiration to Newcastle United. And I think his form in 2024 is, has been iffy. Not necessarily the first half of the season, but certainly the second half of the season. And I think we looked more balanced when Shaw came on and Kraft went to right back. Uh, at the back than when Trippier was on. Which leads me into probably the main question. I mean, Eddie Howe has come out after the game and, and kind of suggests that he wouldn't have played Kieran Trippier had Tino Livermento been fit. He said, you know, Ke Kieran's had to play when he's had limited training time. Is So the, the suggestion was, and then he says at the end, you know, the fatigue uh, hit him. So in that moment, we had to take him off. So clearly he was tired. So the suggestion is he wouldn't have started him had he not needed to. But I, I, I read those. It's not Tino Livermento being injured, and you need a replacement right back. But you had other options aside from Kieran Trippier. So if you felt he wasn't ready, if you're putting him in the same bracket as a Joe Linton, as a Nick Pope, where he says he's fit enough to be on the bench, but he's not fit enough to start, you did have other options that you you, you could have used. I mean, look, you wouldn't have wanted to do that, but Jacob Murphy could have played it on the right wing, and you could have brought Almir on on uh, to start or Harvey Barnes to start. You could have done what eventually did do and start Fabian Share, play Emil Kraft at right back. You could have played Alex Murphy if Fabian Share wasn't fit enough to start. But the point is, we're now talking about four or five players applying the logic that they're fit enough to be on the bench, but they're not fit enough to start, yet they're getting half an hour game time. So, uh, you know, it's a little bit confusing uh, slightly. But yeah, Trippier, he just looked like a man that, shouldn't have started. It looked like a man who wasn't ready to, to start. Well, I'm, I'm, hope, the... I'm hoping on Sunday he goes Kraft right back and Shaw centre half with, with Burn and the whole left back. And Paul yeah, like, I hope that's that. our defensive setup. Well, I've seen a lot of people say that, but I, I still think he'll start with Trippier right back despite the performance yesterday. And it wasn't just the, the goal, the first goal that he was at fault for. There was quite a, a few hairy moments. There was a long pass over from the right hand side of Manchester United's play to uh, to the left hand side, where Trippier totally misjudges the the ball, and Ganacho was in, and thankfully nothing comes of it. But it's little moments like that where you know something could have come of it. And for me, I would start Kraft against Brentford, but I do think he'll start Trippier. I mean, look, John, the, the goal, the first goal that we conceded, we've spoken about it, but Trippier should have should have stepped out. And I guess that is just a bit of fatigue from not playing week in, week out, where he's just, he's just switched off. It's mental fatigue, not physical fatigue. It's mental fatigue because it, it's elementary, isn't it? It's elementary that you step out. And it, he was looking along the line, which makes it criminal. If the, if the guy was behind him and he... He'd switched off and didn't know he was behind him, um, which is what Anderson did on the goal against Brighton when he when he had the, the guy behind him come over the top of him and scored because Anderson had lost him and didn't know he was there. But you can't say that, that, that Trippier couldn't see what was happening because he was looking along the line. I mean, it, yes, there was other mistakes in the build-up. Um, as you rightly say, long before Trippier played him on. But there was mistakes in the build-up for all the goals. And as I say, you would think the three scorers had B.O. 
I mean, they were standing alone. It was like Grey's Monument standing in all that splendour in isolation, waiting to get the ball. I mean, the, the, the little lad that scored the opener looked round in astonishment before he put the ball in the net to think, there's an old defender here. Am I not going to get clattered? And by the way, am I on side? And then he just passed it into the net. He didn't have to put his laces through it. He just passed it into the net. Um, and I mean, you know, things like that are, are, are unforgivable, really. And, you know, it, it's nothing new. It's been happening all season. We've lost 11 out of 18 away. And the only reason why the goal's difference away is... is, is closer than it ought to be, is that we scored eight at, at Sheffield United, which, you know, makes our goal total away from home increase because we got eight, but that was freakish. And um, we, we're just letting goals in left, right and centre. And as I say, we're playing away again. Now we're down to a three-match shootout, aren't we? We're down to Brentford against us. We're down to Chelsea v Bournemouth. And we're down to Brighton v Man U. And, I mean, Chelsea have timed their run perfectly. I mean, we're not going to catch Chelsea. And Chelsea have been warning us game by game by game by game because they've gone on a terrific run. And they're going to win. They don't be born. Chelsea, we aren't going to catch Chelsea. It, it, it's a matter of playing for the Europa Conference League, us or, or Man U. And even then, if it's us, we'll still have to wait for confirmation until the FA Cup final in case Manchester United, by some miraculous means, get a result against Manchester City. Absolutely impossible, we say, and I pray that's right. But as I, say, I think we can remember an FA Cup final not so long ago when Wigan beat Manchester City in the FA Cup final at Wembley. So anything's possible in the two-horse race. I would fully expect um, Man City to win. But we're now looking to pick up scraps and squeeze into the Europa Conference League um, first subsidiary preliminary round, etc., etc., um, by getting a result on, on Sunday. It, it's it's all deflating, isn't it, after what it was a, a couple of weeks back? You know, it's all sort of... The, the momentum that we got going when we'd only lost one out of... Eight was it, which was the Crystal Palace um, defeat. You know, it's all sort of deflated. It's like somebody's taken a pin to a big balloon and popped it. And uh, that's the Geordies at the moment. Um, and let's be truthful, as we go into Sunday, the impetus is all with Chelsea and Manchester United because they go into the last day on the back of a victory and we go into the last day on the back of a defeat. Yeah. Yeah, I, exactly. I mean, it would have been ideal to go into the last game uh, of the season not needing a result, but we do. And to go in on the back of uh, a point and a defeat to, to Manchester United and Brighton, not ideal at all. Now, the first goal, John, United reacted quite well to. Anthony Gordon should have had a penalty. Amrabat stands on his heel now. In real time, you can't see that, but that's why VAR is there. And on the evening in which we know there's going to be a vote for the future of VAR, that was announced just before the game, you would have suspected the team talk in the VAR room would have been, right, let's put on a good show because we, we might not have a job come August. And they've had an absolute nightmare because VAR should be picking that up. Okay, you might need two or three different angles of it. You might need two or three different watches of it. But once you see it, you see it. And I just can't well, get he, my head around how that's not a penalty. Well, his sock was a bit of a giveaway, wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, it was it, the, the hole in it was huge and you could see the Achilles is red wall underneath it. I mean, it, you know, it, that was a clear, clear penalty. No question about that whatsoever. Um, the tackle was right down his Achilles, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yes. I mean, I, I'm glad we haven't brought it up until now uh, because it's absolutely right. But I would hate to to hide and say Newcastle only lost the game because they didn't get a penalty in that situation. No, they didn't. And I hope none of the players, and I hope Eddie Howe, is not hiding behind that privately when they get together again up at Benton. 
because it isn't the reason. But having said that, it's absolutely true that it ought to have been a penalty and it might have changed the game. But the way we played was horrendous. And to be truthful, the lovely strike of Lewis Hall, and God bless him for the performances he's put in, because Gordon and Hall were far and away our best two players in my eyes, uh, the lovely strike of, of, of Hall right at the death camouflaged the result more than the penalty because, you know, 3-1 would have been more realistic than uh, looking at it from our point of view, not their point of view. They weren't that good, but we were that bad. We've talked about the back four, we've talked about the keeper, we've talked about the midfield we run through and missing chances up top. So, you know, that is a 3-1 defeat scoreline. 3-2 looked a lot closer and it was a lovely strike by Lewis Hall. Uh, but the reality is that we blew it big time. Hmm. Anthony Gordon did come out afterwards and he said, you know, we've missed enough chances that we can't really blame anyone but ourselves. So he's not looking at that penalty and saying no, that's he's the not. reason they've lost. I thought, John, his interview view afterwards was absolutely superb i thought it showed a real maturity and he said everything that we've been saying for months you know in theory var should work but it doesn't he said either get rid of it or get better we'll talk about the vote in a moment but i really thought anthony gordon's interview showed the maturity of a future newcastle united captain he was calm he was reasonable he was logic wasn't emotional he was just straight to the point. And for me, I just sat there watching and thinking, there's a future Newcastle United captain right there. Maybe. I'm, I'm more concerned about today than tomorrow. Uh, we'll decide on who the Newcastle United captain is tomorrow uh, when we've signed four top-name players who might just be captain material. I'm happy for him at the moment just to be doing what he's doing and then... Uh, Perhaps stopping all these silly bookings. They almost they, he's been suspended twice this season. Bless him, and he's our best player. And I've said all along that he's the player of the year, and he's got that. But he, he does some silly things, as you know, to be captain. He does some silly things, and has got some very silly bookings this season, as Bruno has. And he seems to have got a bit of a grip of it near the end. I'm just happy for him to be the great player he's become. Because last season, he didn't look like that at all. In the second half of the season, just after joining us, he's responded to the physical demands, the mental demands. He stayed fit all the time. The only games he's missed is suspension. So he has had a terrific season for us. I am delighted for Hall because he had a terrible time. Ignored week after week after week after week. And he is stuck to it and has come out of a very difficult time showing that he's got genuine character to keep going. And once we inevitably had to buy him because they quali what we didn't know about was, you know, the position we were going to finish imploded on whether we had to buy him or not. And then we start playing him and good on him. He's shown he's got character. I'm not suggesting he's the finished article by any means because he isn't. But there's definite stuff to work on, and I think he's shown terrific character. So good for Gordon and good for Hall uh, down at Old Trafford and over the season. But we're running out of people we can throw superlatives at. And Isaac has struggled the last two games. He has looked as if he isn't, that he has genuinely a problem with illness because he's looked nothing like the bloke that scored over 20 goals in all competitions this season. Yeah, and we'll get on to that chance that he had, because I think it goes back to a wider point, and a point that we've discussed many a time, but just based on his performance last night, we will have to discuss the whole striker and Callum Wilson issue again, if just to reaffirm where we stand on it. But first off, Anthony Gordon gets a goal. It's a lovely move by Newcastle. Isaac to Murphy. Murphy pops the ball in the box and Gordon slides in to, to finish it off. And he, he was the danger man all day. Him and Lewis Hall, as you said, John, standout performers. And we had the England coach, uh, Steve Holland, in the crowd. I don't think Gav Southgate was there. But, you know, if, if, if he was casting an eye, one final eye over Anthony Gordon and asking the question whether he should be on that plane for the Euros, Gordon... Uh, 
that's a big tick there, wasn't it? Because he, he was brilliant yesterday. Uh, I mean, would you, would you take Gordon or would you take Rashford? You'd take oh, Gordon, Gordon all day long, yeah. wouldn't you? Rashford will still be on that plane, though. I, will, I know, I will but I'm just it. saying, if you were there last night, and you, which guy would you take? Oh, you would Gordon, take Gordon all day, all day long. long. Not even Newcastle bias. It's just based on, on performances this season. You know, 11 goals for, for Gordon, 10 assists. He deserves to be on that plane. I think he will be. But I do think Rashford somehow will also be. But let's get on to Isaac then, because... 1-1, one, one, John. Newcastle then have a, a really good spell to, to put the game to bed. Joe Linton has a chance. Longstaff has a chance. And Isaac has a chance. We'll concentrate on the, on the Isaac chance first off. Good counter. The seize on a mistake from wan -Bissaka. Gordon runs on forward. Now the pundits, Wayne Rooney, Andy Cole, Roy Keane, all kind of said that Gordon should have carried it forward a little bit uh, more. I mean, I think that's a little bit irrelevant because at the end of the day, he's given it to Isaac. And an Isaac who's sharp, who's fully fit, who hasn't had this illness, puts that away. It's a great sliding challenge from Amrabat. I think the bigger point, John, is it reaffirms Newcastle's need to go out and get a striker who can be first choice next season because there's not a chance that Isaac should have been playing yesterday. We needed him to play because there wasn't an option to replace him. Shouldn't have played against quite Brighton. Clearly, yeah, Shouldn't he's quite clearly Brighton. carrying something. Quite yeah. clearly carrying something. And it just reaffirms Newcastle have not got the options to replace him, let alone when he's ill. I mean, just out of form. They haven't, but, so they need to go out and they need to buy a striker as a priority in the summer. Well, we've, but we've known that. And, and by the way, it shows Newcastle United because they tried to buy the French kid. Remember the French kid that went to Paris yeah, Saint Germain? Yeah. Instead, they, they tried to buy the French kid. So they, we need it. I mean, dear, oh dear, you, you don't need, you know, raise a real vision to be able to see that Newcastle needed a centre forward. Goodness gracious me. I mean, we played against Brighton where we had to win. And by Jove, it was proved that we had a win when we didn't, and then we lost to Man United. When we had a win, we played the last half hour with no centre forward on the pitch because Isaac was off because of his illness, and Wilson was off on Shergar running down the time. Um, so we didn't have a centre forward on the pitch. And, you know, last night, Isaac wasn't Isaac, and Wilson again was missing. Um, it's absolute priority, but so is the centre half with uh, with um, Botman out and Lascelles out, and so is a number six in our opinion, if not the club's opinion, and so is an outside right. You, you know, I mean, there's there's number, but will they do all that, or will the hide well, behind well, um, financial fair play doesn't allow us to, or whatever, whatever. Who knows? That's probably for another day once we get Sunday out of the way. But we need a centre forward. And we'll reiterate, or I'll reiterate what I've said for the majority of the season. Wilson's a wonderful centre forward when he's fit, not fit, long enough. Get rid. Get a few million and put that in the pot and get rid of Almiran and put that in the pot and, and let's see where we go and etc, etc. Um Wilson's not reliable enough. You can't go with Isaac. He suffers from time to time. All centre forwards can. You can't go with one centre forward anyway. You know, when that centre forward was Kane, it's Spurs or Bayern Munich who's scoring all the goals. You've got to have cover. You've got to have more than one. You've got to have one on the bench. And you've got to really, in an ideal world, have three centre forwards. Um, we've got one. Yeah, and we're paying the price now for Wilson's illness and an injury record, and that was clear to see that Isaac probably shouldn't have been anywhere near the pitch yesterday, and he would have put that chance away if he was fully fit. Longstaff, he should be scoring that. Uh, there was a chance for Dan Byrne as well, which was cleared off the line by Casemiro, and you had Joe Linton coming on and forcing a, a save via a header. Um, look, they had the chances, John, didn't they? And I think if we're looking for positives, I don't exactly think we're scraping the barrel by pointing out that they created enough chances to win the game. And that, that has to give you a little bit of hope, right? Well, yes, to a certain extent. But I always say that, you know, when, when a team misses chances, that's as much bad play as it is when defenders 
go missing for <clears throat> on the goals at Manchester United. You know, we should score. But always with strikers, for some reason, Andrew, if we should score, oh, that's great, we've made a chance, we should score, and on another day we would. Sorry, if you miss them, that's bad play. It's not good play, that's bad play. If you miss chances, that's bad play. The same as it's bad play when Trippier stands off on the first goal, when we stand off on the second goal and the third goal, when Dubrovka doesn't do well, we say that's bad. But when forwards miss chances, we say, oh, hey, we got there on another day, etc., etc." It's bad play to miss chances consistently. Everybody's going to miss a chance. But it's bad play. And, you know, we've got to stop doing that. And, yes, for for one fleeting, wonderful moment, which we can perhaps almost have forgotten about, when we went to Burnley and we went with two centre-forwards, Wilson and Isaac, and we absolutely, it was a game we had to win, and we did win. And I know the opposition wasn't great, but we did win and we took them apart. And we had those two centre forwards and we thought, by Jove, brave team selection. And we'll have that against Brighton. And then we'll have it at Man U and at Brentford. We are going to qualify for you. And all of a sudden, we haven't. And not only have we not got those two together, but we haven't even got one of them completely fit because Isaac hasn't been completely fit. In either of the last two games. So, you know, and, and how how fit is Isaac and Wilson or how sharp are they going to be at Brentford on Sunday? Are they suddenly going to come out like they did at Burnley? Pal, I, you know, I we fear... We hope, John. I fear not because they're, they're suddenly going to become rampaging bulls. They're suddenly going to become desperate dans and, on Sunday, are they? Well, let's hope so, but... Um, it's not guaranteed. We don't even know Dick Wilson's going to be there, though I, I suspect he will be because he's got nothing to hold himself back for. Mm, yeah, well, it's going to be interesting to see the, the, the team sheet. I just quickly want to talk about the, the, the two goals, the other two goals my United scored, and particularly the second goal because Diallo and marked on the edge of the box in my United corner. A beautiful strike, wonderful strike. But how on earth is he allowed to stand? He's not even on the edge of the box. He's inside Newcastle United's box, unmarked. And it was the third time they'd done that same routine and he'd been found a couple of times before. My question on it is where is the organisation? Who? Someone on the pitch has to be switched on and think, that's worked twice before. We've been lucky here. Someone... You know, either shout over to the touchline and say, "Can we move him? Can we can we move him to the edge to mark Diallo?" There's been a real lack of communication there, and that goal is nearly as bad. I would say, some would say, probably worse than the first goal. It just it just reaffirms a total lack of organisation at the back. Well, as I say, you would have thought that the two kids had B.O. I mean, the the way they were allowed to stand unmarked. Close inside our penalty area on both the goals, beggars belief. It is absolutely nonsense. I mean, it's schoolboy stuff. And you know, marking up on set pieces, you don't need a genius to do that. You know, most sides do that as a matter of course. Um, and when sides don't do that, they're usually in a relegation fight because of it. Because of it. And um, it was just silly but i'm just exasperated andrew because you and i are, are we're geordies we love newcastle united we're passionate about them like all the fans like all the people that'll be watching or listening to this and but we're sick of saying the same thing we're, we're regurgitating i mean are we going to be sitting at the beginning of next week doing this podcast and say did we never learn? Did we do the? Why did we do the same at Brentford, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? You know, it it's it shouldn't be this way, and yet for some reason it is. Now well, there's got to be a savage overhaul and think about the season by the coaches and the manager at the end of the season, because we have got to have a different mentality next season with newcomers or with the players that are already here. Because if we do not, do we 
Are we going to, next season, go back to what we did when we made the Champions League? Are we going to go back to this season again? Because that is absolutely crucial, that we, that we go back to what we were, not what we've become. Is one of the reasons that the back is so poor, as having been so um, uh, tight last season? Because a lot of the backs are the same. A lot of the midfields are the same. Because Tonali hasn't been there. Uh, so a lot of the midfield was the midfield from last season. I mean, Bruno was there last season. Longstaff was there last season. Uh, Willock was, has been there this season, was there last season. The back four, most of them were there last season, apart from Hall. But we're totally different. Side. The same players are totally different. Um, and that is here. That's mentally. Uh, mm. That is switching off, or do they just think they're good players, and therefore you just go out, and ninety minutes later you come off and we've won. Yeah, I mean, if we had the answer to Newcastle's issues, John, we probably wouldn't be sitting here. I think the arrival of Tosin from Fulham on a free transfer, hopefully that happens sooner rather than later. I think that'd be a massive boost if we can get Lloyd Kelly over the line on a free transfer as well, too quality Premier League centre-backs coming in for, for no fee, that's massive. Not only massive for the fact that they signed them, but massive in terms of the impact on the budget. So that would be an excellent start to the window when that does indeed happen. Now, I just want to quickly run through some more comments that I've got, John, about the reason for their poor away form. Uh, Simon says, lack of depth and quality within the squad, freak injuries, and to a degree, Eddie not rotating the squad, in his opinion, when he had the opportunity he says, sort the depth out in the summer and we go again. We've got William who says, last season was a massive expectation to the usual Newcastle away points total, um, exception, sorry, to the usual points total. We reverted to our far too predictable performances at the big clubs and clubs near the bottom. Uh, it's both an ability and mental thing. The Zig says the midfield isn't in any, anywhere close to being good enough. Eric says, I think the injuries to the squad have brought a fourth a tactical rotation and fatigue at the home crowd. At home, the crowd's energy can help cover those and inspire them on the road. They are just there to be exploited. And um, we've got people talking about the lack of kind of uh, options in the midfield, wanting to see a defensive midfielder come in. And John says, our defending away from home has been really poor at times. We still have a massive gap between defence and midfield. The Bravka doesn't command his box, so the defence is under more pressure. We don't seem to be as clinical in front of goal. Uh, look at last night's chances. We need to take them. And I think John there kind of sums it up, doesn't he, John? You know, defending really poor, massive gap in midfield, missing Nick Pope. The Bravka hasn't got that command and influence and being wasteful in front of goal. I don't think we can really say much more than that. I think that's... Basically, nine tenths of that is true. We've actually scored more goals this season than ever in the Premier League, and that includes the entertainers, by the way. We have got a bigger total. What is it, 79 or 81 now? With, yeah, with I'm not the, sure that, that let me just get the, the full tally, but I think it's a it's closing on a on a on a record, isn't it? I think um, it is a rec it's a it's a record. I, I think it's our best goal scoring season in the Premier League. In the Premier League, not not the whole of our history in the Premier League, and that is this season we have scored more goals than the entertainer scored. The entertainer sides when they finished second top of the Premier League, two successive seasons, we have scored more goals. I'm pretty certain of that. Um, so yes, we've missed chances, but we've scored a pile as well. But certainly, the guy is absolutely right. There's no coordination between the midfield and the back. We run through the midfield, onto the back. Dubrovka has poor soul. I don't want to have a dip at him, but he, he, he's not the quality keeper. Uh, he never he never was in the in the Pope class, um, but he did well in a, in a poor side in the dark days. Um, but there's a hundred and one reasons, isn't it? And but I don't think we can say too much about missing chances. We did last night. But as I say, our goals record over the season in the Premier League 
goals for is excellent. It's impressive, isn't it? Um, we're just going to quickly run through our team for Sunday against Brentford. Last game of this season. I have to be honest, John, watching last night, the way I'm feeling this morning, I suspect our listeners and, and, and viewers will be of the same kind of mindset. I'm not looking forward to Sunday. And I think if Newcastle afford the likes of Tony or Mbemo, the space they afforded some of my United's players, then we could see goals. I mean, look, Tony's probably leaving in the summer. He's going to want one final send-off. And Mbemo, I would love to see him at Newcastle. He's been uh, talked up for an exit. I mean, even Thomas Frank's been linked to, to other jobs. So there'll be a lot of people, I think, wanting to put themselves in shot windows from a Brentford point of view. And Newcastle has still got something to fight for. But they've had something to fight for for the last few weeks, and it just hasn't happened for them. So, before we get into the predicted team, what are you thinking on Sunday? Are you feeling it as much as I am? I am because uh, my head tells me we're not going to make it. My heart, being Jody, tells me something else. Um, but my head tells me you're not going to make it. It's going to be ironic. I mean, Brentford have had a poor season after a very good season last last time round. They've had a very poor season. Tony is not scored in the last 11. Can you believe that? I mean, that is a record for him. It's ridiculous. But he scored three out of four games against us. And wouldn't it be ironic if the guy who was sort of brought up at St. James's Park after we got him from Northampton or wherever it was, wouldn't it be ironic if he scored the goals to deprive us of getting a European place? And that must haunt us because he will... He is going to get a transfer in the summer. He will be saying his goodbye to Brentford. He hasn't scored an 11. He always scores against Newcastle. Newcastle cashed in on him for peanuts. He's going to want to strut his stuff at their place and tuck us up. And we're already made for that. And he must look... I mean, we. I looked at their defence last night. They'd look at Casemiro and Johnny Evans and thought, let's get at them. But he must look at it ours after watching the game last night. Ivan must look at ours and think, oh, I can go out on a high here and I have every intention of doing so. He can, can cement himself as a Brentford legend, get himself a good meal, a, a good move, and say to Newcastle, hey, that's what happens when you let me go. And he can also make certain that he gets on the plane with Ollie Watkins as a third striker uh, for the Euros, because it ain't going to be Callum Wilson, that's for certain. Hmm, say that again. And just on the point of Tony's lack of goals, uh, Hoyland had only scored one in ten before Newcastle and look arrived. At what, at and look at what so happened with him. It would, yeah, uh, yeah it would be very Newcastle United. In terms of the team, John, for me, Nick Pope has to start. If I was picking the team, Kraft at right back, Cher, Burn at centre back with Hall at left back. Eddie Howard, of course, is picking the team. So I think it'll be Trippier at right back with Byrne and Cher in the middle and Hall at left back. Midfield three, if it was me, Bruno, uh, Longstaff and Joe Linton. I'm not entirely convinced he will start Joe Linton. Um, I think he's probably more of a, a, a look in than then maybe uh, Kraft is at right back. And then up top, Gordon, Isaac. Um, and then I think he'll start Murphy. I think you've got a, a, a big case to start Barnes or me one, but I, th I think he'll start Murphy. If it was me personally, I think Murphy's coming for a lot of stick in recent games because his end product for some hasn't been there. But again, as I said in the last show, he's been putting the ball in the box, but no one's been on the end of it. I think he's done a decent enough job. So, the right wing, John, the toss up. I'm not really too fussed, to be fair. But I yeah. do think Eddie Howe will. I think he'll. I think the main point, John, Eddie Howe will st stick with Trippier on Sunday. Well, you were convinced that he would bring bring in Joe Linton at Man U, but he didn't. We don't know what he's going to do because he always does something a little bit different. And of course, we don't know who's picked up knocks that might keep them out. Andrew, we had no idea the Livermento had done his ankle. And until we got the team sheet and he wasn't even on the subs bench, it man you. So and and there were knocks last night, not least to Anthony Gordon. Let's hope he's fit. 
I mean, you know, because he, he was hobbling over to do his after-match interview after the game. We need him to be fit. We've got to hope that he's acts not just there in name only. We've got to hope that Wilson is capable of sitting on the bench and coming off and making an impact. Um, there's so many ifs. Um, it, it, yes, it depends on Eddie, but Eddie's got to get it right. By he, I will repeat what I've said earlier in this podcast. He has said all season that our intention is to get in Europe. That is our goal. If we've got one game left to, to achieve that, if we don't achieve it, is that he's saying by his own admission that this season's been a failure? Because if our intention's been to get in Europe and we don't make it, we failed, haven't we? That is a point um, some would put forward. And I can see where you're coming from. Um, how we, How is Sunday going to go? Are Newcastle going to get the win? <laughs> great question. Great question. I mean, I'm I'm battered by what's happened recently, and my heart is is absolutely taking a a pounding. Um, my head tells me we're not going to make Europe. My heart, as a mad daft Jody, which we all are, and we all carry hope. My heart tells me we are going to make Europe because. We've only got to match Manchester United's result. We've only got to match what they do and we finish above them in seventh place. It then goes down to the cup final and Manchester City win the cup. We then go into the Conference League. Now, I can actually see us losing at Brentford and Man U losing at Brighton and we've, we've matched them and, and getting to Europe that way. Can you imagine that? Getting into you with one point out the last nine, which is uh, which is what it would be. But with if we match Manchester United's result, we'll both win, we'll both draw, we'll both lose, then we finish seventh. And that's the only hope I've got. I'm not looking that we're going to got to win because if we've got to win at Brentford, we can be struggling because I I, I can't make a, a case out for us to win at Brentford. But I can make a case out for us to match Manchester United's result on Sunday because they're no great shakes. We made them look that way when you look at the result, but they're not. So we could we could match their result and get into Europe through the back door. Well, you never know. Bournemouth might do any a favour and beat Chelsea. We beat No Brentford. chance. No chance. You never know, John. We beat Brentford and we actually end up finishing uh, sixth. It's certainly going to be interesting. Manchester United, of course, at Brighton, who failed to beat Chelsea after holding Newcastle to a 1-1 draw. So thanks, uh, Roberto De Zerbi, for that. Certainly going to be um, a tough game, but Newcastle have got the goal difference in their favour. Hoping for three points, but like John, I'm not feeling overly confident about this. Maybe ask me in a couple of day, t days time and the, the optimism maybe will have flooded back into to my way of thinking but if you ask me now I'm going to go for a draw uh, it's the best Newcastle can hope for which actually John might please our listeners because I had a few uh, tweets yesterday sent after the game which said can you and John please stop predicting Newcastle United to win because every time they do every time we do they don't so we're both uh, predicting not to win. I'm going to go for a draw and hopefully, you know, whatever it is, karma, fate, whatever word it is, I'm not even sure what the right word is, it works in your cattle's favour and we do clinch Europe. Yeah? Yes. I, I think <laughs> if we clinch Europe, it will not be spectacularly by us having a super win at Brentford and seeing off everybody else. It'll be a draw and sca scraping through or whatever but you know what come you see i tell you what I, i've also had fans say to me andrew that after the heady thing of being in the champions league this season and the wonderful 4-1 against paris Saint germain do we want to play in the europa conference league which sounds a bit like something gates had used to play in, in my time the conference uh, I can't get around the name of it completely with a lot of clubs that don't mean anything early on in terms of huge attractions, you know, the, the clubs from Romania or wherever, whatever. And so do we really want that? 
in my answer is yes, because we haven't won a trophy since 1969. And it's better next season to be going for three knockout competitions, FA Cup, League Cup, in the Europa Conference League, than it is to be just going for two. Uh, you've, we've got more chance of perhaps getting some silverware. So I want us to get in, backdoor or not, because I always remember, because of um, my age, we got in the back door to get into Europe for the first time in the club's history through the back door, having finished 10th, and we got in the FAZE Cup. And lo and behold, we won it. And that is the last trophy we've got. So if we get in the back door, if the Europa Conference League this season and win it next season, that'll do for me as a consolation. I agree 100% with you, John. I would snap my hand off right now for the Europa Conference League. I think it would be a fantastic experience for the fans, for the players. And at the end of the day, it is still a major trophy to be won. I know people turn their noses up. The same way people turn their noses up with the first cup, but it's still a major trophy. So I'm all for it. But fingers crossed, you know, we don't even need to be talking about Europa Conference. We can talk about the Europa League because we finished sixth and we pipped Chelsea. Look, that optimism's already flooding back in. I was um, going to say, yeah, yeah, I'm going to have to tie your ankles around the bottom of the chair again. <laughs> you, you're going already. Um, but let's see what happens. John, thank you, as always, for popping on to the podcast. You guys watching and listening, please like, follow, subscribe, whichever platform you're following us through. Leave us a rating and review. Share the pod amongst Newcastle United supporting friends and family. Head over to chroniclelive.co.uk for all the latest Newcastle United news. And we've got plenty of podcasts coming uh, this week. We'll have the view from the opposition. We'll have uh, one with Lee Ryder as well to look to the, towards the ends of the season and what Eddie Howe had to say in his press conference and we'll have Get in the Bin as well which usually goes out on Tuesdays but we didn't put it out this Tuesday it's going to come out on Saturday so if you're, if you're looking for it it is coming just coming a few days later thank you as always and for myself and John we will see you guys next week